Another sold out show out here on the road. Got a little fame, work with some big names. Everybody says I'm on my way. I was given an interview for People Magazine, and the lady that was interviewing asked me to describe myself. And I hadn't really been asked that question before. I don't know, I was like, I'm kind of a war hippie. The article comes out, and the title of the article was Self Proclaimed War Hippie Scooter Brown. And when I saw it in headlines, there's something there. Hi, my name's Donnie Reese. I'm one of the founding members of the War Hippies. I am the violinist, uh, pianist, principal songwriter along with Scott. I was uh, in the United States Army, served uh, in Iraq with the 1st Infantry Division, in the Combat Engineer Battalion in 2004-2005. My name's Scott Scooter Brown. I'm with the War Hippies. I'm a singer-songwriter, guitar player, served in the Marine Corps from 99-2003 as a scout with uh, First Light Armored Reconnaissance. The creek don't rise, town folk hollering, hang them up high. Sin is sin in the good Lord's eye, and the hangman's waiting just to watch you die. Dead man walking, dead man walking. I really fell in love with the storytelling aspect of country music. It was the first music for me that like actually made me feel different emotions and not just like a song. I actually started writing songs before I could play a guitar. I really got into Western poetry, like ba Baxter Black. And so I actually started writing like Western poetry. I just didn't tell my friends about it. You know, it was like one of those things I did by myself. But I think from like 10 years old, I knew that I was gonna join the military. I wanted to go join the army. Freaking love Rambo movies. I want to be a Green Beret, you know? And I show up to the recruiting office and this dude walks out and he's smoking a cigarette with a slouch and he walks outside. Hey man, uh, what you doing here? Am I supposed to see you today? And I was like, yeah, I've got an appointment with you. I'm gonna join the army. He's like, dude, I forgot you were coming. Just sit on the curb, I'll be back in like 20 minutes. And I'm like, cool, man. So I'm sitting on the curb, five minutes goes by and this door swings open behind me. And I look over my shoulder and this Marine comes walking out. Freaking dude was Jack, perfect uniform, creases. He goes, what you doing? Just waiting for the army guy. And he looks at me, no shit, and he goes, you wanna look like that bag or you wanna look like this? I said, I, I wanna look like that. And he goes, step into my office. I, I loved it. I actually learned to play guitar in the Marine Corps. A buddy of mine was walking across the parade deck carrying a guitar and had a cowboy hat on. And I was like, man, he looks like he should be my friend. I knew a handful of chords and we'd hang out, you know, and play and the chicks thought it was cool. And I was like, dude, I, can you teach me a few chords? And so I started stealing his guitar and taking it down to my room and he'd always have to come get it back. And finally one day he's like, get your checkbook, jump in the truck. You're gonna go buy your own damn guitar cause I'm tired of you stealing mine. And man, when I had my own, I became obsessed with it. Uh, so I started playing the violin when I was about 10 years old. Uh, they brought the orchestra through my elementary school and I begged my parents to let me play the violin, so I picked it up and honestly took that thing to the bathroom with me. And I ended up getting a full scholarship to college, went to Miami University in Oxford. Started playing professionally when I was about 14. Uh, my dad was a rocker, so, you know, it was the first thing I was learning outside of, you know, classical music was, you know, Dust in the Wind by Kansas, Zeppelin and Rolling Stones, Bob Seger. Also a huge country music fan. Grew up on Garth, grew up on Randy Travis, Chris Yearwood, Winona Judd and all that. And, but just music in general, I love it. Um, it's always been a part of my life and uh, always will be. I have a military family. So my grandpa was uh, in the Marine Corps, in the Korean. My uncle Tony did two tours of Vietnam. My uncle Jimmy was in the Marine Corps. My great uncle Donald landed on the beaches of Normandy in World War II. So I had a, a strong inclination towards the military. When the towers went down, uh, I went to the Dean of Students who gave my scholarship back to college. And uh, that's when I went and served in the Army. It was something I had to do. It was, just, it was, it was, it was, I had to serve. I just joined with whoever could get me to Iraq the fastest, honestly. That was, I didn't really put a lot of thought into it. Got into Iraq in about February of 2004, and uh, uh, we came home February of 2005. I had my dad's 1973 Yamaha when I was over there, and I played, I'd, I think I learned Dave Matthews' entire catalog of music while I was over there. Just playing for my buddies, riding around, you know. I hit the ground running, you know, as soon as I got home. Started to uh, figure out how to build my own little home studio 
So I started, you know, with an iMac and a keyboard, the house and all that type of stuff. And I went on to play with, uh, with this in the singer-songwriter world. I was touring with an artist named Eric Baker out of Knoxville. Got in the front men, which are the lead singers of Little Texas, Restless Heart and Lone Star. Uh, that landed me on the Lincoln Memorial, playing the Make America Great ceremony for Donald Trump. As far as a civilian, I've done several tours as a GS-15, entertaining the troops and doing uh, things like that with MWR. So I've gone back to Afghanistan, been all over uh, Africa, all over Asia, all that stuff, doing the MWR tours for the troops. And being able to get back and do that has been, has been really cool. Dude, I, I loved my job in the Marine Corps. I loved being a scout with LAR. Uh, we were kind of a jack of all trades, you know, You'd do a little demo stuff, do, do a little reconnaissance, do some combat patrol stuff. I went over with the 15th View. I believe we left in December, uh, got to Kuwait in January sometime, you know, did the workups. And uh, we would run like little reconnaissance patrols to the border at night, running uh, those ancient man packed SIDS cameras and uh, all, all that freaking archaic crap that we had. I'll never forget the morning that we were just lined up, all the vehicles, the oil fields were burning, the skies were black. And I was just sitting there thinking like, holy shit, this isn't, this isn't rehearsal anymore, like this is for real. Had no idea because we were prepared to take on uh, the actual military um, and tank platoons and all these things. And so we ended up crossing the border in the south um, uh, took the Umkasar Naval Port, Battle of Nazaria, we're the diversionary force in the uh, Jessica Lynch mission. We called it running the rabbit. So basically, they would just send us out in these little towns that nobody had gone through yet, see if we get fired at, call it in, return fire, and then run security for a lot of the uh, uh, reserve units coming through to, that were building out the uh, airfields and stuff. I actually really liked it. Run across that desert, I felt like I was like riding with Genghis Khan in freaking Sackett Cities. Like I felt like there was something in my archaic DNA that was like supposed to be there doing what I was doing. So I moved back down to Texas, doing my thing down here, get married, wife, kids. And at the time, I'd worked offshore on oil rigs for a while. I did construction for a while working downtown Houston. I take this random like exposure gig up in Denver for free and uh, it was a military deal and I was like man I already told him I'd go and I'm gonna go do it and so the guy that was emceeing the event was a Navy SEAL and he was like dude you're a Marine like love the stories and the, and the songs it's like I know this guy named David Corlew in Nashville and he, he manages Charlie Daniels and I'd love to connect you with him and of course in this business you hear this crap all the time and you're like okay but yeah a few weeks goes by and I get this email from David Corlew and it says, hey, me and Charlie have been listening to your music and Charlie wants you to come out to Nashville to play his 80th birthday volunteer jam. And I was like, we'll be there. So we start working with Charlie and then Charlie kind of becomes my mentor. And I get a text message saying, hey, what are you, what are you guys doing on this night? Charlie wants to invite you to come see the Grand Ole Opry if you've never been. And I was like, man, I'd love to. So we pull in at like six o'clock in the evening go backstage, I meet Charlie back there, and he, Charlie's taking me around the Grand Ole Opry and showing me all this stuff. And I was like, how do I, I land in, in this spot, right? And we walk out to the, to the stage, and there's the circle at the Grand Ole Opry. And he said, there it is, son. That's what we all do it for. I was like, you want to step in it? And I looked at him, and I said, no, sir. I said, I like to step in it when I earn it. And he was like, all right, son. Four years later, I get a phone call from Charlie Daniels, inviting me to come have my debut on the Grand Ole Opry at Scooter Brown Band. A few weeks later, that that week that I played the Opry was exactly 20 years to the day that I stepped in the footprints at MCRD as I stepped into the circle of the Grand Ole Opry. If that ain't wild. First time I ever met Randy Travis. It was an unfortunate time when I met Randy Travis because he was actually at the funeral of a very good friend of mine by the name of Chris Kyle. And I was there to sing a song that uh, Chris and I wrote together. And uh, I got done, and the first person I saw when I walked backstage at Dallas Cowboys Stadium on the 50-yard line was Randy Travis. We went back to his ranch in Texas. He pulled a couple of guitars down off the wall, and he handed me one, and he took one. And it was like, for me, it was like putting, pushing a, a number on the jukebox. I was asking to play all my favorites. 
But the coolest thing for me was that when he get done playing one, he wanted me to play one and tell him about it. When you got a guy like this that's had this many hits and is a Hall of Famer and just one of the greatest, not if the one of, in my opinion, the greatest country singer of all time. <laughs> meant the world to me. I actually met Scott years ago at a video shoot. We just crossed each other's paths just briefly. And years later, during the pandemic in 2020, he had made a post on Instagram about supporting veteran-owned businesses. And so I sent him a message and I said, hey man, I'm a combat veteran. I've got a studio over here in East Nashville. You should come visit. And he did, he came over and visited. And then we, we really hit it off. We were like-minded, we got a lot in common. You know, we served very, you know, he served in 03, I was served in 04. I had found out that he was mentored by Charlie Daniels, which, you know, I mean, I'm a fiddle player. So, you know, and then, then you know, he asked if I'd come down and, and play with the Scooter Brown Band. He was still doing the Scooter Brown Band. And so we went down and, uh, and, and he asked if I would, uh, come and do a charity event with him. We're on the way over to the show and I'm talking to him and it dawns on me that I've never heard him play. He doesn't know what I do, I don't know what he does. And so we get backstage and I'm like, so what are we gonna play tonight? And he's like, I don't know, I'm just gonna wing it. And I was like, all right. I said, uh, you know, you got any key signatures or anything so I can at least get a, an idea of what we're gonna do? And he's like, nah, nah, let's just, let's just go for it. And I'm like, all right, I like your style. We got a two and a half minute standing ovation. And it just kind of blew up in our faces. Like it just turned into something way more than we ever anticipated. We were opening for Tracy Lawrence down in Alabama and I filled in with the Scooter Brown band and we were on the way back and he goes, hey man, I've always had this idea for this band and you know, called the War Hippies, but I need another combat veteran. I need, a, I need you know, somebody else to do it with. And I said, I said, that sounds like a great name. Let's, let's, let's give it a whirl. My beautiful wife, Christy, is also the, our manager for the War Hippies. We've been together for 22 years, married for 18. She's a perfect fit for it. And she really facilitates everything. Scott and I are, are knuckle-dragging meatheads. I manage War Hippies. Working with War Hippies, it's such a different act. They get an amazing sound with, um, you know, originally just the two of them on stage, and now they've added the drummer. And even still, when it was just the two of them, the sound that they were getting um, was just so huge, but also so personal. And so even playing arenas, you know, seeing them opening up for Travis Tritt, you know, we're out with them and being able to capture an audience in the thousands with just two guys was such an incredible thing to see. And so it's just really neat watching them soar up and grow this thing and, you know, continue to connect with fans on a, on a ground level too, um, which is, something they're just so good at. For the most part, it's a really good experience because I think that we're all very like-minded. And then in the fact that like, especially guys that have been to war, because like the music business can chew you up and spit you out. Like, I mean, it is a tough, tough business. And I think for us, we're like, ain't nobody shooting at me. Ain't nobody trying to kill me. This shit's easy. Donnie and I are musicians. We are artists. We are songwriters. We are creators. I mean, our album, everything that we do, we produce ourselves. Um, we produce all of our music videos ourselves. We direct them ourselves. Um, our drummer, Paul, shoots it all. Like, I mean, it's literally everything's in house. And we want to use our platform to make awareness for veterans' causes. The song was written, based, you know, when I got out of Iraq and um, kind of looking back on everything. And it was based off of a promise that I had made God and saying, God, if I make it out of here alive, man, I'm going to. I'm gonna go home, I'm gonna try to live my best life possible. I wanna try to pursue happiness the best of my ability to be the best husband one day and the best father, the best friend, um, and go live my life just in the best way I possibly can because I believe that we all owe it to our brothers and sisters who died for the idea of freedom by putting a uniform on um, to come live our best lives. We just come off of some, some, some really bad combat deployments, some, some combat patrols, some, some, some nasty stuff, lost some friends. And uh, I, I, had, I had sent an email to my wife's father 
uh, that I wanted to marry her. And I started that email off with, if I make it out of here alive, I want to marry your daughter. And so uh, you talk about serendipity. I think that's the definition. Because in the veteran community, it's so easy for a lot of people that um, kind of go downhill with booze and pills and a lot of stuff. And, uh, you know, I think if we make it our mission to live our best life for our brothers and sisters that didn't get to come home, that that's what they would want. So. Eighteen feels like you're so grown up. Well, you volunteer to fight for the things you love. Sacrificing everything and love and hold dear. You can die for your country, but you can't drink a beer. If I make it out alive, I'm gonna hold her a little more tight. I'm gonna tell my old man I love him. And I'm gonna praise God for my life. And I'm gonna live for every sunset. And for every sunrise, I swear I'll be a better man if I make it out alive. But you never heard a loss until the fire comes down. Never knowing if you're gonna live or die. He can sure wage a war in a young man's mind. Now if I make it out alive, I'm gonna hold her a little more tight. I'm gonna tell my old man I love him. And I'm gonna praise God for my life. And I'm gonna live for every sunset and for every sunrise. I swear I'll be a better man if I make it out alive. I'm gonna praise God for my life And I'm gonna live for every sunset And for every sunrise I swear I'll be a better man If I make it out alive If I make it out alive And yes, we want the music to transcend all, you know, walks of life and hit people in different ways. And, and, and obviously, yes, hit the veteran community, but also hit the whole rest of the world as well. I, th I think we're just going to take it as far as it'll go and, and keep it going as long as it will. It's a, seems, it's, it, everybody seems to be responding to it really well. The music is, is coming very naturally. Scott and I have a very, uh, we, we work together very easily. Uh, it's all, uh, the chemistry's right where it needs to be. Live shows are great. And uh, all of the things that, that, that need to fall in place are falling in place. So we'll just, we'll, just, we'll just keep going with it and hopefully you'll see us winning CMAs and Grammys and stuff like that. That's, that's it. <laughs>